So good morning and welcome. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Auto Hub Show. And now a word from one of our sponsors. This is Gail. Hi, this is Gail Rubenstein, the founder and CEO of Retail Resilient. Car dealers all over the country love working with us, and let me tell you why. We have two product solutions that they absolutely love using. The first product solution is a Facebook and Instagram school where we build out a curriculum for salespeople and managers. We teach them how to create new car offers, use car offers, and get pre-approved offers. We also have a campaign management program where we generate leads for them, and then they do what they do best, they sell cars. So we train their sales staff on how to handle social media leads. Our car dealers typically say to us, I had the highest grossing month in the history of my business. I'm up double in my volume year over year. Um, we even had a client the other day that told me that he was absolutely blessed because he loved our customer service. Everyone at Retail Resilient works remotely from home. I hire only car people from all over the country, so I hire all A players. They're really good at what they do, and we absolutely love helping car dealers. So give us a try, give us a shout. You know, any opportunity, we would love to see if we're a fit to work with you. Thanks, Gail. Uh, and I always like to do a couple books. Um, Effective Dealer by our former guest, Max Zanan. He's also got those books now in Russian, just in case you were, weren't aware. Driven, The Race to Create the Autonomous Car by Alex Davies. And Automotive 101, The Car Industry Exposed from Jonathan Michaels. Uh, from Barry? Hi, this is Barry Jordan from WhiteGlovePerformanceGroup.com. I'd like to take a few moments of your time to share how we can make you more profitable. Dealerships all over North America are using our cloud-based power dialing platform, Touchpoint, to manage their outbound sales generating phone calls. With Touchpoint, your agents can make up to 50 calls an hour. Leave a voicemail, send an email with a link to a video or to your website, all with a click of the mouse. We specialize in empowering your teams to make the calls that make the sales. How can Touchpoint help you increase profit? Check us out, whitegloveperformancegroup.com. That's whitegloveperformancegroup.com. And Jeff will go over our disclaimer. Yes, my favorite part of the show, the disclaimer, <laughs> just telling everybody the views and opinions uh, on this show are those of our guest speakers and our guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Auto Hub Show or Ian Nethercott or myself, Jeff Polo. Whether we agree with it or not, we officially don't agree necessarily. <laughs> and uh, please read our disclaimer on our website or on here so that you uh, know that anything said here ain't our fault. <laughs> In a busy dealership environment, finding time, ways, and means to maximize sales potential can seem overwhelming. And that's where we come in with the Performance Management Partnership, a unique and proven solution to help you increase sales and market share. The program includes needs-specific skills training, coaching, mentoring, and counseling. By focusing on critical factors, behavior goals, outcome goals, and performance-specific analytics, we help you build an effective, high-performance sales culture. As your team increases sales by an average of just one or two deals per month per sales rep, the math will speak for itself. For example, two additional sales times six sales reps over 12 months equals 144 additional sales per year. Multiply that by an average front and back-end gross of $3,000, and you just made an extra $432,000. We've helped dealerships achieve closing ratios as high as 51.9% and volume increases as high as 43.7%. And we do this with the program's ongoing support, weekly phone conferences, monthly on-site meetings, and precise feedback targeting specific needs. Call us to learn more. Thanks, John. Now, uh, Jeff, we'll go ahead and get started. Yes, good morning again, everybody. The, this morning is our Trailblazer show, and we have some three really interesting Trailblazers on there. But before I get to that, I do have to say, please check out our uh, our sponsors, not just because they're our sponsors, but uh, some really great stuff there. Uh, I've looked into uh, Retail Resilience uh, Facebook uh, 
uh, programs and wow, it really is something. Uh, white glove, I know Ian's used quite extensively in, uh, in his real job. And uh, many, many people from Automotive Business Solutions, our friend John, who is here today, uh, tremendous, tremendous processes and the real way of doing things. So please check them out. But today we have our Trailblazers show. And uh, now that we spent a lot of time on other stuff, uh, we'll talk about our Trailblazers. First Trailblazer we have here today coming to us from a teeny tiny little, little town called the general New York City area. Uh, yeah. is uh, Bill William Camastro and uh, Camastro, Camastro, I don't know, sorry, Bill. But uh, Bill, can you take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everybody. And thanks for having me, uh, Jeff and Ian. Glad to be here. And thanks for your participation in uh, Hashtag Level Up. You guys are a great addition. But uh, from the New York, I grew up in the Bronx, a place where you, many of you are familiar with and wouldn't want to visit. And uh, we have the, uh, we're the number one Cadillac dealer in the Northeast and, and we're, in the, we're in the top, uh, 10 or 15 in the country. I've worked with three public companies over a 20 some year period of time, 37 years in the car business. And uh, I just, I'm, I'm one of those guys that can never learn enough. I realized about 10 years ago, if I didn't stay current and, and try to stay ahead of the curve a little bit with digital marketing um, and all the nuances in the car business that I'd become a dinosaur. So I, I invest my time in, in people like, uh, Jeff and Ian and to stay involved as much as I can. So that's where I'm at. And uh, in, in fact, uh, I know one of your other guests very well, another, another guy who's part of our group. So thanks, thanks for inviting me. I really pre appreciate being here. Well, Thank we you. really appreciate you uh, being here. And of course, you're a, uh, a trailblazer. They're founder of Level Up and of course, uh, part of a small Cadillac dealer out there in the Northeast. If you can make a claim to you the biggest uh, in the Northeast US, wow, there's not a lot of places that you could say, uh, you're better than maybe in the Northeast area of Beijing. So uh, yep. congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Second, coming from us from really a very large metropolitan area, St. Helens, Oregon, is Andrew <laughs> Suvanvich. Did I get it right, Andrew? Yes, you did. You did. Hey. <laughs> now you'll take my calls. Um, he's the dealer and general manager of St. Helens uh, Auto Center, Ford and Chrysler, again in St. Helens, Oregon, uh, famous for the... Uh, the former volcano don't know what it is now maybe it still is andrew can you take a moment and introduce yourself hey yeah guys thanks thanks a lot for having me it's, it's nice to see you guys I know some a couple familiar faces on here and again like bill mentioned from the from that level up group but uh about out here in st helens for about five years uh it's uh, my first store got a four new chrysler store and i am a long time car guy i've started uh 15 years old washing cars and kind of uh sat at many many seats in the dealership um found an opportunity a few years back and and really i think probably a little bit more difficult than i really will say it but fought tooth and nail to kind of put everything together move families and sell everything you have and, and go off on this endeavor so i got a, i got a really big passion for not just the industry but for for the people in it and uh you know being in the industry for so long you, you look at um some of the other industries and you, when you look at some of the opportunity our industry really has and uh it fills me up um so yeah got three kids two in high school one in one in middle school and i and, and i'm a big avid kite surfer so which is why i know squamish so well cole <laughs> well thank you very much I, i've got to tell you something for a guy who over zoom looks only about 25 having kids in high school <laughs> <laughs> Same thing well, you Bill, start. You, know? you got to go. You got to go. We don't like to wait. You know, we like to get it going. Yeah. Well, you know, the old days they used to say about the car business that aged you. But uh, obviously with you and uh, Bill there saying 37 years, yeah, he looks 45. And, um, you know, it's it's really something. But thank you very much. Uh, it takes a lot to, uh, to run something, uh, multiple stores in a small center. So, again, that's the reason you're a trailblazer. And speaking of trailblazers, we have Cole, boy, Cole, I better get this right, Kaczynski? Nailed it. <laughs> Cole is the Vice President of Marketing from Foundation Automotive Group. And I do have to say something we didn't know. This, this company is a real trailblazing trailbla company. One thing I didn't know was they started uh, in 2017, four years ago, and today they now have 21 stores panning the, uh, spanning the U.S. and Canada, and unlike many groups that we find these days, they're either Canadian or American, uh, we'll call you a Can-Am group. So Cole, can you uh, take a moment and introduce yourself? And thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, Cole Kaczynski, 
uh, moved down here to Texas. So we kind of moved our head office uh, right in the middle of the pandemic, actually. So I, I moved beginning of March, right before all the lockdowns came in, in Texas. Believe it or not, we were locked down in Texas for a little while. Um, just opened up a little bit before. But yeah, uh, Foundation Automotive, we've been uh, been in operations for four years. Uh, I believe our, our first year, as I was saying before the show, first, uh, first store was in Squamish, British Columbia. Uh, Drayton Valley was our second store. And then the next year we bought, I believe, 10 stores. Now we're at 21 stores uh, with expectations to grow to 40 by the end of the year. So uh, aggressively growing, lots of great opportunities out there. But more than anything, we just have we have great partners, great managing partners um, and uh, a really great team at Foundation that's that's helping us grow and, and meet our goals. Fantastic. And, and a little bit about your history in the business. Yeah, my, my history. I grew up in automotive. Um, yeah. So my, my father owned a dealership. Um, from basically the day I was born. So started working when I was 15, sweeping the shop, washing cars. And then uh, through a college, I was in sales, went into F&I and management. And then, uh, yeah, I took a marketing degree in school. Uh, started working in marketing, had a few of my own businesses. And then once foundation started up, it was a great time to get back into automotive. So um, as VP of marketing, this is kind of, uh, you know, what I was, I was born and bred to do. So it's, uh, it's a great fit. And it's honestly my, my dream job. So yeah, love doing it. Fantastic. For those of you who don't know, Calgary and Houston might as well be the same city, only with a little different accent. Am I wrong? <laughs> yeah, very much so. Um, it was, it's great here. I, I love it. I, I honestly, people ask me, okay, well, how, how do you handle the heat? Like, is that, is that much better than minus 40? I, I'd prefer minus 40 to, uh, you know, plus <laughs> 35 and 90% humidity. It's, it's hard to get used to for sure. So. <clears throat> to say i am uh, i'm constantly sweating fantastic <laughs> ian take it away so question in your opinion what's what is the definition of a trailblazer and let's start with cole um trailblazer i think it's somebody that's that's changing the narrative and the preconceived notions of what automotive retail is right and if we're speaking of you know automotive retail or automotive industry in general right um, there, there's tons in this day and age, people that are constantly setting the bar higher and, and making us all adjust our practices, right? Like I look at somebody like Elon Musk, even though he's, uh, you know, he, he'd be somebody that's kind of flipping the whole model, this franchise model up on its head. Um, it's, it's making everybody change the way they're doing business and the way that, uh, that consumers are expecting the experience to be the way employees want to be treated um yeah different ways to buy cars so it's uh yeah th those are kind of people that i would i would look to when i think of okay that's that's somebody that i want to follow that i want to chase to uh to see how far we can go with this industry thanks cool uh william what do you think um uh, you know I, I along the lines of what cole said a trailblazer for me is is a person who will do what no what everybody else might be afraid to do or hasn't done been done before and, um, you know, I, I think people that, that think big, that have big vision and, and like to like to actualize what they're thinking may be, they think like that. You know, I, I just from my personal experience, I, I got involved with the public environment um, years ago when you at United Auto Group first went public. And, and because, at, you know, I, I had no general manager experience, my first general manager's job, and I wanted to be a general manager so bad that I took a, a Suzuki a Hyundai Isuzu Suzuki franchise or, or group of stores in, a, in an old Cadillac building. Interesting. And at the time, the Suzuki uh, Suzuki um, Samurai had just rolled over, so <laughs> their sales their sales were down by ninety percent. The Isuzu Suzu had the rodeo and the trooper that for one ninety nine and two ninety nine, and if you didn't lease it, you couldn't buy one. <laughs> and then we had Hyundai with the XL for forty nine ninety five. It was a three speed stick, no air, and cardboard inserts in the doors. And that was my. So I, it, uh -huh. well, nobody those franchises. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. I wanted to be a general manager more than I than I wanted to worry about what the franchises were, <laughs> and because it was the public environment and it was new to the industry. If you could take a store that was losing a million a year and make five thousand dollars, you could affect earnings per share more than a store that made two million every single year because it created public enthusiasm and the investment community would dive in. I didn't know anything about being a general manager, Suzu, Hyundai or Suzuki or the public environment. 
But when I was able to turn the store to a $5,000 profit after years of losing lots of money, their earnings per share went up by, I think it was 14 cents in a quarter when they first went public. And with a couple hundred million shares out there, I became very, very popular in a hurry for reasons I didn't even understand. Because 5,000 wasn't a lot of money for a car dealership. And I knew nothing about the investment community. But then when I found out, you know, kind of like Lewis and Clark, when you make your way into the great Northwest and you start discovering places like Vancouver or, or whatever, um, you, you, you start to realize why you set out on the journey to begin with. And that's when, that's when I, I, I began kind of making that my, my passion. So they would start to transfer me all over the country to failing platforms. And I've lived all over the United States and I've gotten to see a lot of great places. But to me, that doesn't make me the greatest trailblazer of all time. It just, you can't be afraid to look over your shoulder. You, there's a little risk involved. Some of it's calculated, some of it's blind. But I think not having a lot to lose has a lot to do with how much you gain in terms of being a trailblazer. So. Wow. wow. So true. So, so what's your advice on uh, Suzuki globally? <laughs> <laughs> Build a lot of motor, build a lot of motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andrew, yeah, it's funny, Bill. You say that because my, you know, I cut my teeth at the Suzuki store. I mean, that that was that was where I cut my teeth, washing those cars, setting them around, and and you know, I beg, I beg for a job, and uh, they wouldn't give me one. I beg for a sales job, a sales job, and then finally, Auto Show, in Portland Auto Show, comes around, and they go, they need some more staffing, and they go, well, heck, they hold up their shirt and they say. Well, you fit this shirt, so go ahead and go get them. But, but yeah, it's a Suzuki's a great a great story. So, I, I think I think I'll, I'll agree with these guys too, as far as a pioneer. For for me, I think it's really simple. I think I think pioneers are guys who are. I think uh, trailblazers are like pioneers, really. Yeah, they're they're blazing trails, and they're not just blazing trails where you want to go, but they're blazing trails for for everybody to get down to. And I think that's what makes that makes a trailblazer is somebody who can not really just identify you know markets and in and, and, and new product but but really take it down to the ground level all the way through to where that exchange really happens innovative you know they're already disrupting disrupting the way consumers are behaving the way our businesses are behaving and so yeah not only the guys that you want to follow they're they're they're, they're people that have laid that way for us uh to make it easier for us like resistors or those other people and uh, they're, they're, they want to go the path that nobody wants to go. They, they've got that that gut instinct, and they can actually take it all the way down to market. So that's what I take on. Good answer. So uh, thanks, Rob. Andrew. Uh, so seeing as how you're on screen with everybody right now, um, who else do you consider as a trailblazer in the automotive retail automotive industry? Well, in the retail automotive industry, I think. When I think about that, you know, I look at a couple of different variations of, of trailblazers to me, at least in, 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 my, in my, my travels. I, I think you got guys who, you know, I worked for, I worked for a, a, a wonderful group for, I think, 12, 13 years. And I, and I, didn't, I'm, I saw that dealer principle twice. And you now it filled me up going, oh, God, how's it? he's got all these groups. He's done a great job. Boylan Auto Group. And he's a great, great guy. He won the, won the World Series in 1974, got out, went to Portland. Uh, got in with the Ron Tonkin group, but I thought, how did I not see this guy for 12 years? And now and then you realize, well, he spent 18 years doing what I'm doing right now, grinding it out, bringing the processes and setting up the accounting processes, bringing it to market. And so you got guys like that who have taken, who have taken a small opportunity, been really influential in our dealer body, taking about 11, I think he's got 11 plus GMs that he's put in the stores. Um, you know, that wasn't my exact story, but that, that's a trailblazer. You, you got guys, multi-generational car dealers right now, I think are, 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 are what we're going to see a huge, huge uplift is in trailblazers. Uh, you know, Cole, you might hear this all the time, dealer signs, you get the dad owns the store, you get these things. But I don't, I don't think you realize that there are some amazing multi-generation stores going on right now where, where I'm watching right in my local town stores that have been here for 60 plus years, right? Dad, grandpa had it, dad had it. Now, next thing you know, you get this, the, the, the third generation in it, and these guys are blowing up doing what Cole's doing. I mean, they got 22 stores in the last five years. They're running process procedures. They're really I taking some of that empire, that hard work that their family put down, laid out, and, and they're making it forward. So, so that's a trailblazer. And I think guys like Bill, I mean, I, you know, I, know, I know he's on the call and he's a guest on there, but, but Bill's a guy that I connected with. And he was another guest on another show. After the show hung up, 
I pick up the phone, I call him, midday, hectic as heck, I don't know if it's a Monday or a Friday, we spent an hour on the phone with the guy, Intr introduced me to hashtag level up, and uh, guys like that, you know, he, he's fulfilling his passion, but he understands how to get it down to the ground level and, and connect everything, he's bringing his people into the level up groups, he wants his people to be aware of all the stuff that we think, and we go, we go to all these seminars, we study, we look, we look, we look, but, but getting that down to our people to start thinking the way we're thinking, I think, is, is what makes somebody a blazer. So, so yeah, Bill, you're one of my trailblazers. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I'll oh, guess he's, he's, he's going to feature you next time. Oh. <laughs> Who else? And I already mentioned Elon Musk, and you can't mention him again unless you can, perform it, you can pronounce his son's name. But who else do you consider a trailblazer in the retail automotive industry? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to give a, a shameless plug here to, uh, to our group, to my boss, uh, from our chief operating officer, Chuck Kramer. Um, honestly, like, you know, it, just what you're saying there, Andrew, it's, it's uh, kind of learning from the past, but still embracing the future. And that's something that we've done so well in our group and why we've been able to, to really turn profit and, and really turn a lot of these stores around that have been, you know, under market and uh, underperforming. So <clears throat> Uh, yeah, absolutely. What he's doing, um, what we've instilled in our group, right? Um, like even last week, I was at uh, at Digital Dealer and got to attend like all the, you know, speak to all the different vendors at the convention and um, attend some of the classes. And it's just, it's amazing how many groups, you know, we talk about digital retail and we talk about digital marketing and how, um, you know, this is the future and, and how many stores still haven't embraced that, right? So, you know, having somebody that's been in the industry like Chuck for 35 plus years, that's constantly looking forward and needing to adapt. That's how you stay relevant. That's how you blaze a trail in this industry. Um, we've got a lot of really great partners that I'd consider trailblazers, right? So we're, we're very, uh, we're very much in partnership with Cox Automotive. Um, so we utilize a ton of their tools, uh, CRMs, right? So I, I would say what they're doing as far as, um, you know, their automotive intelligence is, is amazing. Right, we're able to identify in-market shoppers before they even submit a lead on our website, and it's things like that. It's innovations like that that you know I push my team because I oversee the BDC as well. Push my team uh, in the BDC and in marketing to embrace these tools and utilize them. Get on performance calls. So not only do we have the, you know, have it, we're actually learning how to how to make it benefit our business. But things like that. Um, we, we've got another great partner that we've been working with. I, I know, Ian, you, you know of him, uh, Paul LaHall. Yep, He's a yep. company called Connect AI. And uh, so we've implemented that in all of our stores. And I got one case study in particular. Essentially what it is, it's a sales assistant. It's a fully conversational uh, artificial intelligence sales assistant that will set appointments for you and uh, won't take sick days. It won't complain about, you know, working overtime. It's, it's really great in that regard. But, you know, we got one store that we took from, you know, ashamed to say it, but we were we seven percent closing ratio, and in a month and a half, we got up to fifteen percent, which is our expectation, right? So, um, yeah, I I think that really it's a combination of a lot of things. It's these big groups that allow us dealers to to um, embrace technology and blaze some trails. Terrific! Thank you very much for that. And uh, William, how about from uh, your end of things? What's your opinion? Um. You know, I, I've been I've been blessed to be around a lot. I, first of all, I'm older than those the other my the other two guests, so I've been around a lot more people than they have <laughs> by default. So, uh, so I'll have to say, without sounding sounding overly uh, ambitious, I I was very fortunate to be with um, part of the first automotive group that went public, and you know, I actually got to meet a guy by the name of most people wouldn't know who he is. His name is Carl Spielvogel. And Carl Spielvogel, first off, he's he was uh, he's of note. He brought the first advertising agency public in the United States. He also brought Hyundai to the United States. A lot of people don't know that. And lastly, um, he was the CEO of um, uh, United Auto Group when they first formed and went public. And and he took the first automotive group public which has changed the landscape in this industry dramatically. And I got to watch all the gyrations that, that they went through up to and including the dark period after they first made their public filing. And, and I, I received stock options before I even knew what they were. And, you know, it, it just uh, totally amazing. 
and and I, I I'll mention two other guys in the industry. One one would have to be um, a guy by the name of Sam DeFeo, who I worked with, with in Jersey City. Sam sold fourteen stores, uh, formed a management company called Emco Executive Management Company. Sam sold the fourteen stores in his group to uh, United Auto Group before they went public. When they formed United Auto Group and they went public, Sam was then hired back as the COO of the very same company he sold to public company to become public and served as a COO for many years of the company. Um, he, many, uh, many of, there are a number of stores that you were in UAG's holdings that, are, that pay leases on his real estate. And on top of that, uh, in, in somewhere in, the, in his late 60s now, spoke to him yesterday, he's now building up again on the private side post, you know, the public environment. So, but he does it differently. I mean, his father, his father was a baker in the 40s and 50s, Sam Sr., who passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was a baker. He had six bakeries in Jersey City and Hoboken. Everybody knew him. Big Italian area, obviously. Everybody knew him. Everybody went to his bakeries. Nicest guy in the world. Very personal touch with every single person. And Buick came to him at Buick Olds in the 50s and said they wanted to put a car dealership where one of his bakeries existed. He said, I'm not, I'm not selling you the property. So then, they, <laughs> so then they said to him, well, what if we make you a car dealer? So he figured, I know everybody in this area, in a very densely populated area, right, right across from the Statue of Liberty. Um, he put a Buick Olds dealer there. Uh, ultimately, probably between him, his son, and his grandson, they've owned hundreds of dealerships. They became the first public company. And today, they not today, but they did it a few years ago. They renamed Communipaw Avenue in Jersey City of DeFeo, Jersey City DeFeo Way. So from, a, from an Italian immigrant to a baker to a car dealer, to owning hundreds of dealerships to being worth probably a billion dollars to having a major thoroughfare in Jersey City, New Jersey named after you. That's a trailblazer to me. So I, I don't think, and I think the last I would name would be, you know, a guy like Dale Pollock, who everybody on the call knows that came, that developed, you know, the velocity model, which, which essentially in one way, shape or form is adopted by almost everybody in the industry at some level. That's and that's a and, and the guy the guy's legally blind. I mean, it's amazing, totally amazing. So anyway, hopefully that helps helps the cause. But those people amaze me as trailblazers. Wow, thanks for that. That's really interesting. So did did he re, did he retain ownership of the bakeries as well? Yeah, no, they're long since that they're long since out of business. Okay, but I think I think what had ultimately happened. Um, he, he ended up owning somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or 25 dealerships in the New Jersey area. I think in the beginning, he sold a lot. He sold his interests to raise capital for other franchises. I think he became, he became very well aware that he didn't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning anymore. And he can make a lot more money <laughs> and not get, he could wear a suit, and not get flour all over himself. But, uh, you know, he, he, he dove in and became a full-time car dealer, but his, their name is still a household name in, in the, Greater New York and Jersey area. Wasn't Sinatra from Hoboken? Yeah, in fact, Hoboken, when you pull into Hoboken, there's a sign that says home of Frank Sinatra and the home of Little League Baseball. Little League Baseball was invented there. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Um, so question for you, referring to the changes that have happened in the last year, we're all heading to what appears to be the new normal. Um, <laughs> How, how do you think the changes we've seen, how is it going to affect the changes we've seen in the business in the last 16 months? What, what do you think the new normal is going to be, uh, Wayne? Well, um, that's a really, that's a loaded question. So it's like when people say, you know, you turned around a dealership and you were able to make it make money. What's the one thing you did? Right. <laughs> right. I wish I had that, that tie with that pattern hanging in my closet, but that's not the way it works. Uh, <laughs> My my opinion, I think when inventory, I think well, this is my hope and my opinion, two different things. My hope is the manufacturers have realized that supply and demand is a thing. I hope they've realized that. 
because for everybody on this call, it's made us a lot of money, put additions on our houses and bought us custom made suits. Hopefully it's been an unbelievable without cars. We're making more money than we've ever made. Right. So that's the amazing part too. I think it's teach it's teaching our managers how to be better managers and, and manage inventory better. Um, learn how to say no to no to a car deal that we don't need for sure. Uh, but I think the biggest thing, the new normal for me, when things get back to back to what we might call normal, our new normal is going to be there's going to be a lot more emphasis and focus on, you know, being per, the early bird to the worm, meaning, you know, we're getting much better as an industry at understanding di the digital sciences, much better understanding that you got to get to a customer 10 minutes or less or someone else is going to get not only will they get to them, but they'll take the car to them. They'll deliver the car at their house. They'll go pick them up. Now, candidly, whether it might have been quasi-legal or not, wherever I've operated, I've always done that. It always gave me an edge on the market. So what we're seeing now, to me, is just what I've always done. Now, there's more technology that allows us to legitimately do it and get paperwork signed and documentation done accurately. So I, think, I don't think you're going to see any less personnel in your dealership. I just think that your people are going to be doing different things. If we're going to be hiring, and the biggest thing for me, the people that we hire, the people that we employ, our business is going to be much more, I think, professional, meaning you can't just hire 15 people, take them up in a room, training for three days, and then fire everybody who doesn't work out except for the two guys that make, that have the best line of bullshit. I don't think our business is going to be that anymore. I think we're going to be able to hire a, a better caliber person. We're going to need to hire people with uh, digital skills. You know, know how to, they know they have to know how to turn a computer on and off and spend most of their time in that and, and also be able to market themselves on the phone because there's going to be many fewer customers in your showroom that just happen by. So to me, it's just a, it's a, it's just a cultural mindset. I think we're going to, technology is going to always be around. It's always going to evolve, but we're going to have a much more savvy individual that we hire even from the ground floor up. Just my opinion. Well, thanks, Bill. Um, cool. Cool. I actually have a question, uh, gentlemen. Oh, yeah, we do. Um, from Bill, uh, Bill Harvey, not Bill Camastro. Um, so, will the retail entity continue to figure out how to sell virtually, sell, sell it to or in their home, and what training will be required? Who would like to answer that? Maybe Cole. <laughs> Sorry, can, uh, can you repeat that? Excellent question. Will the retail entity continue? Perfect. Uh, virtually so oh yeah absolutely I, I wanted to expand on that anyway um that's something that you know as soon as the pandemic hit we embraced in in all of our stores is digital retailing right understanding the customer journey and utilizing data um to to better make decisions on on what tools we're going to use what parts of the process we need to improve um i i think that the pandemic just kind of uh, it, it made all these dealers either adapt or die when it comes to an online experience, right? So you got to think, okay, well, if everybody's using these tools, what are some things that we can do to separate ourselves, to differentiate ourselves? So, um, you know, we started working on uh, other ways to brand ourselves, right? Utilizing social media to increase that reach and, and it, you know, explain how easy these processes are. You know, one, two, three, you can get a vehicle delivered to your house, right? Um, the whole Carvana model, we adopt a little bit of that, right? Say, you know, you apply online, you never have to come inside to a dealership. We'll drop it off at your house. Uh, we got some of our stores, our, our Henson stores in uh, Madisonville, Texas. Tiny Madisonville, Texas, just north of Houston, 3,000 uh, 3, people. We got 150,000 people that follow us on social media, sell to every state throughout the country, right? Because people love our brand. They love what we do. We give away a car every month and we explain this experience and make people a part of it, right? So we show, hey, it, it doesn't have to be the same way that it used to be. You can buy from anywhere and we'd prefer that you buy from us. If, if you like us and you wanna work with us, we'll sell to you, it doesn't matter where you live. So um, I hope that it continues because I think that we're getting quite good at it. And we've, like I said, all of our dealers have embraced it and, and we see that we've only really scratched the surface. Andrew? Not on that question. Yeah. You know, I, the, the, and the questions, the retail entity continue to figure out how to sell virtually, sell, sell into their homes, and, and what kind of training are we going to have? I, I think, you know, one, I think this is still a retail person to person business or a, a person business. So whether we're connecting with them digitally now, like we are together today, or we're connecting in a different way, I think 
I think what we have to continue to adapt to our digital retail, but I think it looks a little bit different than we thought it was going to look like when, 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 when COVID first came out. I think we thought we were going to be able to sell this whole Carvana model way. We we're going to put one, one CTA up on our website and everybody's going to drive through and then we're not going to have to talk to them. And so I think in the beginning, the early adapters, we've spent a whole lot of time trying to figure out what tool we're going to use and, and does our feed spill into there and does this feed fill into there and our taxes aren't calculated incorrectly and the customer checks out, that's not going to be correct. And, and I think really what we really needed to figure out was that or to pay attention to is that with the technology, with some of these AI tools and the, autonomy, and the automation coming, is that, that, that the manufacturers have, are, are, are like getting smarter, right? They, they've got these data share agreements with us now. And, and as a kid, I always thought, well, why, you know, you try to write ads, you do your newspaper ads, and you try to, you try to put it out on the, on the paydays, the right paydays of everybody and, and the days that everybody's going. But, but now you, you can really change it. So we, we've got these layers where we're going to connect with our customer down the sales funnel. And I think the retailing tools and the technology now is allowing us to catch those customers well, well before they're, they're our typical form submission people that we see when they go to our site or they find a link and they put their information on. And it goes into the same type of a, type of a bucket. So I think as these, 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 these Cox automotives and these digital airstrikes and, 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 and these, these digital retailing tools continue to develop, we will continue to develop our integration and connectivity. Um, I think that's what's going to happen over, the, over, over us. You know, we, consumers are becoming more accountable in our industry than they've ever been. Uh, you know, Bill, Bill hit it right that, that the connectivity with, with what we're doing and the customers, I mean, look, customers now, we have to be more professional in our, in our industry. So, so as we, as we are transparent with the customers, now customers are giving us a much better, a much better uh, look. In other words, they'll schedule a test drive. I mean, I don't think I've seen more scheduled test drive in my entire life over the last year. And, and customers will call and say, can I schedule a test drive? I mean, in my life, I mean, you're out there waiting anytime. You'll do anything. You'll, you will dry, go to, to death for the customer just to, you know, once you have them. And now we can kind of take a little bit step back and say, hey, look, we can, we can provide you the experience you're looking for. And I think that's where, where some of these manufacturers are figuring out. It's not the stock, the promote, the 15K off. It's like, let me help you start at the buying process you're at and get you down. And the better that these dealers in ourselves can use the tools that are available and connect them, I think we'll continue to do digital retailing. And it, and it won't look like they're gonna buy a car 100% from the dealer. You know, it won't look that way. But it will look like, hey, we're going to catch you in the act now, right? We're going to we're going to catch you, and we're going to put you back through, and we're going to figure out where you're at, and we're going to we're going to change the way we do business um, in terms of how we identify where you're at in your buying process, so we can better consult you. So yeah, I think it it has to change, and I think the tools the dealers are going to train is the technology and the tools that that some of these wonderful vendors are are putting out. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I think what I've found as I've went through the car buying process over the last two years personally, is there's dealers who just don't get it and are still operating like it was 20 years ago. And there's dealers that are like, yeah, how can we make it easy for you? And technology is part of it. But more importantly, it's you can anticipate where that customer is now with technology a lot earlier, but it's how you handle that customer between that point and, and to sale. And people are only coming in one maybe 1.2 if they don't like the first experience. So you really have to do it right, right out of the gate. And more importantly, you can do it today with training and technology, but customers really don't want to come in just to kick tires as much anymore. And I think that's a good thing for dealers. What do you think, Wood? Say it again? If I what, can what do you think about the training point. side? What do I think about the training side? Well, I, I think that, you know, I think at, on it, quite honestly, <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of, you know, on a separate separate to that, but part and parcel of it is is the the offsite training. I'd like it to be in store first of all, but mo most importantly, I think again it goes back to the type of individual that we hire. Because back in the day, we'd hire somebody that had a good line of shit. Excuse me. <laughs> but nowadays, you know, you have to have skills. You have to have skills. So to train people to do what we want them to do at a higher level, their capacity has to be greater. And, you know, today I find myself, I look at, I, I like to meet everybody we interview and I do a lot of the interviewing myself. 
as big as we are, I still I still want to make sure the person across the desk from me, person thinking somewhat at my level, or at least in a, with it with a similar capacity, to understand the digital yeah, media and so on. Like for example, in our meetings, even for sales, I show I put up our analytics uh, by day and by month, and then do a comparison year over year. I show that to the salespeople. I show them the journey of the customer from where they where they could even click on your site and do a little research to the point where they go down the funnel to a lead and then what our bdc responses are our response times um and all of our percentages for shows appointments and we look at all of that because i want them to understand the, the journey of the customer and i look i if i was hired as a salesperson today i would probably be lost if i hadn't been in the business for 37 years because when i started if you had a if you had a gray jacket and a blue jacket and a, and a gray pair of pants and a tie, you got a job if you could spell your name right because they would <laughs> they would get rid of you in five minutes if you couldn't sell cars. Here's a phone. Here's a desk. If you're bottom if you're the bottom ten percent, you're fired every month. And that was a case where I where I started. Now right. it's you know we make better hires because the, we we have to be able to qualify them to do those to follow those ro rules and regulations and roles that we need them to be in. So, I mean, that's my, that's my take on training. I don't think it's any more sophisticated than that. So yeah. the, the question that we have here again, Bill, thanks, Bill. We like those questions, Mr. Harvey. Um, so have we figured out how to transact different than our traditional 40 year old model? And, um, you know, what about things like the uh, changes Apple made with respect to app tracking? Does that, does that modify your approach? It doesn't, it doesn't modify my approach. Candidly, I mean, I don't think that that app tracking, the, the app tracking uh, attribute is going to is going to make that much of a difference in in my opinion. Um, and what was the other part of the question? I want to make sure I'm clear. Uh, just have we figured out how to transact differently than the traditional forty year old model? But before yeah. we answer that, well, well um, we have we have we have DocuSign, right? We have we can do we can we have apps that allow you. To transact at home, and I understand the question is, well, if we transact at someone's house, and the app is tracked, do they do they grab the customer's information? This is just my opinion, yeah. but the covers are off. If you're on the internet at all, the covers are off. <laughs> if they can get if they can get Donald Trump's tax returns or or you know what Bill Gates made last year from from you know then I don't know. I'm not saying you should you should hang your dirty laundry out there. But I don't think there's that much that uh, other than us protecting the customer's information the way we should. If outside entities want to get that information and work hard enough, they might just get it. So I don't know that it should change your approach because you might just take yourself out of the fast lane by thinking that way. I'll say this. May any dealer have the kind of interest in their business that Trump's tax returns have. You'd be richer than he is. Well, he's yeah. I don't know how rich he really is anymore. Um, some of the most uh, question for everybody, and uh, we'll ask them, is one. I, I've seen a lot of a lot of things this week from from the digital dealer, and um, they're, they're, these are posts of people getting pictures. Um, a guest that we've had is Melanie Borden. I've seen a lot of people. Wow, I met Melanie Borden. Oh my God, I'm just gonna just die here. And um, all, uh, almost all of them are fake now about face to face meetings with good friends. Um, that they've met during the pandemic and never met personally. Um, with all these people I've connected to, you, Andrew, well, except for Ian, and Gail Rubenstein, uh, I've never met anybody, any of you face to face. But wow, you know, one day I look forward to it because it's going to be funny, you know, or lady friend. Um, other than your fellow panelists here, who have you met virtually that have changed your business? And um, actually, I'm going to ask that to Cole. Um, I would say it'd be all of our, our vendor partners, our performance managers, um, implementation teams, right, within Cox Automotive. I see Russell Hill is on the call as well. Uh, we work very closely with Russell Hill and his business, Fixed Ops Marketing, in all of our stores, right? And if we didn't have them, these people that are, you know, uh, able to work from home and still continue to do their job and, and help us with, you know, implementing this new technology and building our new websites for our new acquisitions and um, training our staff on this new CRM tool when we're bringing in VIN solutions or dealer track, right? We're doing a DMS switch. All these people are working remotely. I've never met any of these people, but I mean, 
incredibly thankful. Like we, we, we wouldn't be able to honestly do business without these, these people. So it's been really incredible. Um, that, that's the biggest impact. I still have to travel a lot. I, I travel half, half of the month, every month, um, just cause we got stores all over the country. Right. So still spend a lot of time and, and try to meet, you know, key personnel, like my main performance managers and each of the vendors that we're working with, um, safely, of course, but, uh, yeah, th this year it's, uh, luckily I, I've been able to still get a lot of face-to-face -face time and, and meet people head on. And that's coming from a guy who's relo relocated to the place where they had 38,000 people at a football game. So, uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully that keeps going. And, and in a way, the, uh, the pandemic has been a, a blessing in disguise because virtually we have connected with people we would never, ever connect with, never even dream of connecting with. Andrew, seeing as how you might be the the most beneficial of this just being basically single point store in a small uh, location. Um, who have you met virtually has changed your business? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, yeah, we're single point and, and I think from some of the smaller dealers, I mean, if you're a Ford store, you're referred to as a select or a conservative. If you're, you know, if you're a Stellantis store, you're, you're a Tello or a main store, but I think some of us smaller stores, we, we never have had a bunch of reps coming in here. You know, our town, we don't have, you know, I've worked at a bigger store where these guys come in and they pump your salespeople up. And of course, you know, in-house training and in-house, it creates energy and vibes. And so one of the challenges some of our smaller stores has, has always had is, you know, we're always phone called in. And before video was a big deal, there, you know, I don't know if, if you feel this, but you feel like a little disconnect, you know, um, and, and it's hard to energize your people. I remember as a kid, when our, when our factory rep would walk in, I would, would literally stick right by him and get his contact and call him. And, and sure enough, you know, those guys ended up growing up with me and then, you know, you know, them really well. And, and some of them are, have done well, but um, so what, 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 for, for guys like us, it's, it's a treat because the rest of the world kind of now it kind of put to our, our, our field where now, you know, I agree with Cole, it's much of these vendors, these implementation people, uh, the back end performance managers. It's, it's amazing how much connectivity you have with them now than you than you as compared to before. And it was and you're already conditioned essentially to kind of work through that format. Maybe not just quite with the video chats, but but we're able to. And so so look, met, have never met you guys. Uh, got on the level up hashtag level up. You know, ended up there's there's a the uh, a gentleman from a VP down in uh, from Digital Airstrike, Scott Pexman great guy was on that show. He found out that I was implementing his product. He reached out to my performance manager. We spoke. And, 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 and the real, the real cool thing about that is that there's stuff like, you know, for, for us as in this, at this level, we've got, I think there was 27 different digital retailing tools that was announced with, with, with Stellantis last, last over the last 15 months. So we've got different tools climbing down our throat and it does this, it does this. But I think the real thing for me is that they, to get these connections with these outside sources, we need connectivity. You know, we need to use these tools. We've got 50 different tools. We need connectivity and it goes back to the training. We have to pick a few tools to train our people on. Everybody has to have four monitors or three monitors now because you got to have five different dashboards for a chat system, a digital retailing, a CRM, a DMS system and a trade tool. And, and so to have vendors that you can meet that you wouldn't necessarily have met, he calls over there and we say, hey, we'd like to really, really, like, what do you want to do? We really want to and embed some of these digital retailing dynamic links right into our autoresponder. Performance, you know, it's not typical what it does. Calls over the team after that meeting and, and, and here we go. You know, we've got them in works and we've already got them going out on some of our, some of our autoresponders. And, um, you know, those are the kind of connections that I think have really been valuable during during this uh, virtual meeting. Never would have had a chance to meet that guy. Never, even at another meeting. So so that's what I think is, is, is really nice about this. Terrific. I do have to say a person you may want to connect with who's been a guest with us a couple of times being in a small center and a small Ford store is Rob Ruth, if you aren't connected. And okay. Rob's done a heck, he's a 600 car a month store in a, in a town that's probably smaller than St. Ellen's. So, uh, and also anyway, Ben Smith in Halifax has done wonders with the store he bought recently. He's a Ford operator. He took the store from 60, which I think is their best month ever, to over 200 a couple months in with no inventory. Halifax is huge. Angel yeah. is going to yeah. get there, John. Um, Mr. Camastro, last person on the question. 
So who have you connected with? Now, mind you, I have to say you have, uh, you're, you're developing such a big thing with Level Up. So, uh, you know, who have you met virtually that's changed your business? Well, I, I, see, for, for me, I like to put together, the reason why we did Hashtag Level Up, it's nowhere near as, as organized as, as the Auto Hub show, which is why I'm glad I'm here, because I'm going to steal a lot of stuff from you guys. Hey, no, bro. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I do like the sign though a lot. But uh, <laughs> that's the end. So we, um, you know, our hashtag level up was done for a lot of reasons. One, I find now in my career that the more I try to give or help other people with, not that I'm the uh, the last word, but if anything I can do to, to help, you know, help people improve their businesses. It all, you know, it comes back to me in, in spades. We were on a call just a couple of days ago, and Andrew was on there as well. And we have a really sophisticated, I would say, it's fairly sophisticated BDC uh, lead process and right down to delivery. And he said something that all my managers were on the call, and he said something that really got me thinking because although I, I understand and believe in it, it's the one metric I never really, I have, I have the metric, I have it measured. But I never really tied anybody's compensation to it. I never really, and then and then Josh Leader from the Sands Owner Movement Group started talking about the same thing. And after all my years of doing this, and, and you know having some success, I had to put my, I had to eat some humble pie and put my ego in my pocket and say, okay, well, just hearing that makes me realize I'm, there's something I I can improve my game. So I think along the lines of what Andrew said, the access by Zoom meetings, uh, go to whatever whatever, Skype, however you do it, just having that free information flow that we now currently have, it takes on a lot of boundaries that it helps me change my business because I, I'm i not done learning. I'm a long way from a finished product, but having these sm smart, young, br bright minds around me is really what's helped change my business. It helps me not become a diner. So I'm 59 years old and I feel like a young guy, but I've been around a long time. And, uh, you know, I, I my, my first car, you could see the ground through the floorboards and it wouldn't go in reverse. You know, <laughs> that was my first car. And uh, it was a Datsun, Datsun Honeybee. So just to give you a little FYI. Now, so Bill, my, because, you, because you've been around so long, I need to know this though. When you sold it, did you put wood in there and the floorboards cover it with blue carpet to a penundercoat before you sold it? Well, <laughs> the, 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 I, I, the the uh, the the glib answer is I couldn't afford all the tools to get that to happen. But what I did do, <laughs> what I did do, I, and this is God's honest truth, in the state of New York at that time, you could register your car in the Bronx, but you had to have a bumper. The car didn't have a bumper; it had the two stanchions. So I took a I, I took a a, um, a a two by six, I painted it black, and I bolted it to the two stanchions to the two supports and it passed inspection because you were allowed to do that back then you could do that now obviously because the car was completely unsafe if i hit anything with the car it would have just crumbled into a pile of rust but i i say that because the world has changed so much the thing that's changed my business my approach to my business most is my approach to being open-minded to listening to other people to be perfectly honest with you yeah, well, that's that's the difference in a dinosaur and a, uh, uh, I don't know what it is, but dinosaurs are gone. <laughs> right. I don't want to be gone. <laughs> that's right. Well, folks, Ian? Any final thoughts? Jeff? Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. This has been a very lively show, and uh, we appreciate it. And uh, everybody on today are first-timers for us. Hopefully, you'll, you'll keep tuning in and keep it going, guys. Everything's... Uh, just great stuff and we're all learning tremendously and uh and thank you ian i'll leave it to you to close off yeah, if anyone wants one of these backgrounds there's a bunch of sign companies that have websites and you can create these things for free if you want to buy oh, the sign you can but ian, you're uh -huh. to it's cool <laughs> uh -huh. mine's real actually you can I even do different fonts if you want you can do different stuff it's cool actually just look it up online and if you want the video um, just send me an email or just reach out to me on LinkedIn, whatever's easier. I'll send you that video and this will be up later tonight. Thanks very much for everyone for joining. Appreciate all the input and the thoughts and have yourself a great week. So lots. Yes. Keep safe. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting us. Yep. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thanks guys.